So James, what is the split brain problem in distributed systems? So essentially, this isn't a whole brand new problem, but it's become worse over time with the advent of lots of SaaS providers and the cloud. And what it basically means is having your data in lots of different places, instead of just living in one place like it used to live in the mainframe or in the client server space in one set of databases that you owned all by yourself. But what's the problem with having data in lots of different places? So essentially, Synchronizing the data between those it becomes problematic. And so if you imagine payments in the case of Stripe, where you've got something like a product database mm. in your system, and then you've got the products mirrored in Stripe, how do you know those two things are in sync at any point in time if changes can occur in one or both of them? And the problem really occurs where when your customers start using your application, if it's out of sync, they can find that things go wrong very easily. So what causes the different sources to be out of sync? If you imagine something like the product database, you might have an application on your side where you're maintaining a list of products. And maybe it's just titles and prices or something that relates to what it is you're selling. And you have the same representation in Stripe, but of course you can change things in both places. Um, now you might try to lock it down so it's a one-way flow, so it only goes from one to the other, or you may have changes that happen in both places independently. So you've got your one or many, one or two or many different sources of truth, mm. and they're all in different places for different reasons, I suppose. So you, you've got Stripe for your, your prices that relate to your products or, or, or taking money on those products. Mm. And then you've got your, your catalog of, of actual items on your own database. Yeah, and it's not just Stripe. If you think about using products like Salesforce and other SaaS providers, they have representations of the same sort of data that you probably collect in your main application. But you don't want to centralize it in your application, nor is it really possible with, with SaaS. So you have to learn with the fact, learn, with, learn to live with the fact that you're having uh, different copies of the data living in different providers, perhaps in slightly different states, that's eventually consistent. And is that okay then, to have different copies in different places? Well, people disagree on this. Oh. So this is where you see some people try to build systems where the source of truth is always some major system on their side that's keeping all the changes in one place. That gets much harder to do as you grow, and especially if you imagine a company like eBay or Amazon with product databases <laughs> that are in the millions and change constantly. It'd be very hard to mirror that in real time in lots of places. Whereas if you have a small set of products and you're a much smaller company, that tends to be easier. Of course, what that means is, what tends to happen is people start small and don't worry about this too much because they don't have that many products to worry about. But as you grow, it becomes a problem. It becomes a form of technical debt. Can't you just have a single source of truth and like lock it you know, each time that you're not using it from a particular uh, output or input? If only we could, yeah. right? A single source of truth would be great. I mean, the reality is that in these distributed systems, changes can happen in, in many places. And so you might be able to lock them down a little way and make them so they're one-way changes instead of two-way, perhaps. But generally speaking, I think it's better to think about how you're going to work with these changes that are coming into your system. And is this a problem that is specific to a certain type of architecture? Like... Uh, like a NoSQL database versus a, a SQL versus a serverless, for example? Not really. I mean, you know, if you look at some RDMS or, or NoSQL databases, um, they have similar characteristics in that you have changes that happen to them and you can use change data capture to, to capture those and put them somewhere and then process them. Now, of course, you don't know what your SaaS provider is mm. using, so maybe they're using the same architecture or something different you have to find a way of abstracting that to know how to collect those changes back from them. But generally, the type of database doesn't make that much difference. Okay, so it sounds like you're not, you're not saying that we should have one single source of truth, right? You're saying it's okay to have different uh, parts of the same data in different locations. I think inevitably that yeah. ends up being where you are because you know, if you get away from like, payments, um, products might be in, in your realm, but payments might be something you want to leave with Stripe, given mm. that it really knows the latest uh, state of, the, of your payment data. So trying to get that back into your system, you'd always be delayed by compared by looking at Stripe. So really, you're looking at each system being its own authority for what it's best at using. 
Okay, so then how do we handle that with Stripe specifically? How do we use Stripe for just the payments part of this and make sure that that is, up, is as up to date as it needs to be? So there are a couple of different ways here. So if you're looking at building something that's very resilient, I would suggest, and imagine you're building an AWS, you're taking your changes from your database, capturing those in an SQS queue, and then using some sort of compute to process those changes, such as Lambda um, or Fargate, and then calling the Stripe API to update the products on the Stripe side and making sure you're getting a 200 back for each one of those API responses. That gives you a one-way flow so as you get changes in your product database, Stripe is also being updated. The second method is if you're having changes both ways, if things are happening within Stripe itself, you still keep that first um, part piece of the architecture, but you can have Stripe send you events using event destinations to better capture that data coming back into your architecture. Okay. Let's break down those two different mm. uh, ways of doing it. So the first you said was that you have uh, data in maybe an AWS uh, linked database, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever that might be, DynamoDB or, or some sort of SQL database. And you're updating that using some business logic somewhere and you need that to be represented in Stripe. So you're going to use an API call to send that update to Stripe. You mentioned that you might use, did you say an SQS queue? Yep. What is an SQS queue? Why would you need to use that? Why doesn't that add complexity to the architecture? Yes but it gives you a couple of important benefits. So when you're just taking these changes and calling your compute to call an API, if you have a very busy database, again, imagine eBay or Amazon, something that's a really uh, a vast system with lots of changes, that could overwhelm the API calls. To so, Stripe. To Stripe right. or any, any vendor. Right. Um, so a queue can be used to smooth out that traffic. So it simply backs up the number of messages in the queue and your compute layer is taking those messages off of the queue at a steady rate. So I can configure my queue to send to Stripe or whatever my uh, SaaS uh, product is at a rate that that API can actually handle. Right. It also gives you the benefit that if your compute layer goes wrong, you've got some bad code or the network's down or some other unforeseen problem happens, that the items stay on the queue, they don't just get lost. Ah, so if you're just waiting, if you're just letting your compute update with a one sort of fire and forget. Mm. If something goes wrong, which it will at some point, then you've lost that. You've lost that update, unless right. you have some sort of resiliency in the queue. Right. I mean, generally speaking, it's a great idea using queues and these sorts of systems because you get a lot of benefits um, just in terms of resiliency because you remember failure happens all the time. We mm. say that a lot. Mm. And there are many, many phases in distributed systems where things can go wrong. So. Putting the queue in place as a developer gives you that assurance that the message will be processed or it stays in the queue. It's almost like just the thing you should always do. Like mm. there's almost no downside of it, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, queues used to be really complicated. You know, it used to be the sort of thing where you st set up your own servers to manage. And now with cloud providers, all major cloud providers have queue services that you can instantiate in code and they're very cheap to use. So I, I always lean on the side of using more queues instead of fewer queues. Are there um, open source versions of that as well, of SQS? Yeah, but then you're into hosting things yourself. Right. Um, whereas if you want a, a managed service, just better slot it into your architecture. I generally think it's easier to use um, a cloud provider's product. Okay, so we, we've got our, um, our database uh, with maybe a Lambda function reacting to updates in that database, putting events, update events onto a queue and then that getting queued and sort of batch sent to Stripe to mm. update our Stripe product database. So that, that part of our system is keeping Stripe up to date. What about if we want to capture some data, some metadata from our Stripe objects and send that back to our AWS database? You mentioned before about uh, webhooks and events. How, how does that work? So you can use event destinations in this case. So this essentially means that Stripe will send events directly to your event bus in your AWS account. And there's some benefits to this over using webhooks. You know, webhooks you have to manage, you have to better catch those uh, incoming into your account. If your, your side of, is down, you, know, you end up with a delay and you're hoping the provider will keep sending those messages. When they arrive in an event bus, that part is completely managed for you. You can then attach an SQS queue to the event bus, so all of the messages go straight into a queue. Mm. And then you're doing the same thing in reverse. You're taking some sort of compute, like a Lambda function or Fargate, to pick up those messages and update your own database. So, so every time a change happens to my object that I care about, say my product in my product object item in Stripe, that generates a Stripe event, 
and I can have that Stripe event sent to my AWS account using Amazon EventBridge or a webhook, and I can have that fed into a queue, can I? Yes. And so that queue adds resilient, resiliency going the other way. Yeah. And then I can, from that queue, consume and update my database. Yeah, and the benefit there of using the queue again is that your own database, its primary job is to be serving your application, not mm. to be handling these updates. Mm. So you can throttle the number of changes you want to be processing at any point in time, and also ensuring that there's any sort of problem, you're not losing those changes. But the one thing just to keep in mind with this is that you also have to keep track of the source of the change, so you don't just keep going round and round on this model. So there is that added wrinkle to this. Um, but otherwise, it gives you a, a fairly easy way to implement a full cycle um, way of, of, of implementing these changes almost real time, depending on the amount of traffic you have. I feel like there's a, like an added part in this, which maybe we haven't mentioned, is that if you're using uh, Stripe thin events, which is like really small uh, objects uh, that contains a, a bit of contextual data, but not a lot of information about the actual uh, object that's just changed. So if those thin events are being sent to your AWS account, um, something might have happened since that event has happened, or maybe the order of the event is, mm. is, is out of sync. So I've seen other kind of best practices that say, once you receive that thin event, you should once again call back to Stripe to get the full object, because that is the current like, state of truth, and then save that to your database. Is, is that an, like a, an additional step? It depends, again, on what you're building. If you have a very busy system, that might not be practicable, but, mm. but you can look at the timestamps of events as they arrive. You know, events don't always arrive in order, so you have to factor that in. But you can look at the, the last change, um, the last event that you knew, and to make sure that, they're, that you're handling them in the right order. Um, obviously, this gets fairly complicated when you're trying to reconcile complex products, because some things, when they change, such as titles of products, you might not care so much, whereas if prices change and those go out of sync, you might be more careful. But um, definitely the out of ordering problem with events is something you have to take into account. So you could use some sort of filtering mechanism on that mm. inbound event to check what has changed, right? like check the diff, and then decide if you want to do something with it or not. Yeah, with event bridge, this is pretty easy, actually. You could, you could use an event bridge rule to filter on those events mm. and not incur any compute cost. Uh, prior to processing. And yeah, there are other event bus services that offer uh, similar functionality as well. Mm. What I like about the way you've broken it down is that each each service is doing the bit it's designed for, right? Mm. You've got Lambda maybe doing some computation to see um, what it needs to update. You've got EventBridge just consuming events. You've got EventBridge filters deciding what to do, where to route mm. those events. Um, you've got queues adding resiliency. Instead of just writing this in one big like muddy ball of code, you can you can really lean onto the managed services. Yeah, I mean, it's worth also saying that yeah, you know, what's the alternative to this? So, when I've been involved with applications in the past, what people tend to do is some sort of ETL process mm -hmm. where you wait till the end of the day and then extract both data data sources and then compare them and then then try to reload them back in. And apart from being very fragile and brittle um, when you build this, it's also not real time. You have to wait for periods of time. Now, that used to be okay on these systems when they were closed overnight and you had some window of time where you could do this. But many businesses now are 24 seven and just constant changes. And so this sort of architecture gives you more flexibility for providing that for your customers. Doesn't Stripe also have a managed way, like a paid way of doing this with data pipeline where you can, um, you can dump uh, database changes like into a S3 bucket, for example. Yes, you can absolutely do that too. So for really um, for, for enterprise systems that are much larger scale, that's an even better solution to this. So mm. you, you could absolutely build that. And those events are coming in in an ordered way, usually into a Kafka stream or a Kinesis stream. So the split brain problem is, is actually a, a solved problem already. Like there's there's best practices around how you do this. It's not quite solved because what when you are in distributed systems, you have to learn to live with eventual consistency. And that's really the problem that when you've got two sets of data that are changing very rapidly and there's a network between them, it's the network that adds this complex layer of just knowing what's up to date on each side. And so there are various ways to dial up 
um, either the level of consistency, that tends to be at higher cost with more messaging, more compute, or knowing where in the line that you, you can fit your application. So developers have to decide this really on a case-by-case -case basis for their workload. But I do think it's important to understand what the options are available to you, and knowing that distributed systems, we get all these benefits for using them, this is just a side effect we have to handle. And eventual consistency means that eventually all of your different sources of data will be consistent. Like There will be a point at which they are all representing the same thing. Yes, it means really from a practical point of view, when you query a, a database on a network or any piece of data, it might not be in the most recent state. Right. Just in a, in a, in a sort of basic explanation. And so your application needs to acknowledge that. And there are ways of handling that um, in your application that are very different from when you have a single database and essentially you have all these acid transactions and everything is more or less going to be up to date. Okay, so I know you're doing a talk about this at the London Meetup tonight, which mm -hmm. I'll make sure we, we put in our video link. Are there any other additional resources that you should recommend people go to to find out more? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, we'll have a blog soon on stripe.dev and also the video will be on our YouTube channel at youtube forward slash stripe dev. Great, I'll make sure to put them in the links as well. Great. Thanks a lot, James. Thanks, Ben.